the truth behind the drama of Zakir Naik in India and now his ban in Malaysia. Asalaamu Alaikum guys and welcome to another episode of Smile to Jannah. Smile to Jannah! <laughs> Ever since the BJP, the Hindu Nationalist Party came into power in India, they have been after Dr. Zakir Naik obsessively and with a vengeance. First the allegation that I'm involved in terrorism, they could not give proof. Then they said, I'm involved in hate speech. Then they went to money laundering. Think of it like Tom and Jerry. But here, Tom is equipped with a police force, army, and a powerful country. And Jerry, on the other hand, has a microphone and a hat. They've tried to pin all these accusations on him, but they just don't stick. So the latest bullet in their gun was taking the matter all the way to Interpol. Interpol is the international police. But the ruling came in Jerry's favour. The Indians essentially want an international arrest warrant. Interpol refused that what they call red corner notice. Why are they losing so much sleep over Dr. Saab? Well, he has been giving dawah for over 25 years in India. Alhamdulillah, 25 years. We did dawah in India. He gets over 200 million viewers worldwide from his three piece TV channels. He gets a hundred daily shahadas. Every day, Alhamdulillah, hundreds of people, Allah is giving hidayah due to peace TV every day. And he meets and advises heads of states. And Allah has given the opportunity of us to meet several prime ministers and presidents of the world. That's why these guys thought it important to not only shut down his operations, but dismantle his workforce. In terms of people, we had 500 people working full time for us. Now, only three, four. Forcing him to go and settle in Malaysia. Even in Malaysia, this legend was able to carry on the dawah to such a degree that he managed to assemble over 100,000 people and still speak about the integral issues that are affecting the ummah that not that many people have the guts to speak out on. Many of the Uyghur Muslims in these concentration camps, they are tortured. And with the current Kashmir crisis, the Indian government is trying to censor the people that are trying to speak out against their atrocities. I mean, they're trying to get Twitter pages banned, they're trying to get videos removed. But despite all of this, he still decided to speak out against the crisis in Kashmir. That means now they are learning how Palestine was destroyed and overtaken by Israel. Now they want to do it to Kashmir. What is the Muslim Ummah doing? Nothing. Props to him, but it came at a price. A quote of his was taken out of context, flung around all over the media. He was questioned by the police for 10 hours, banned from speaking in public, and the Prime Minister of Malaysia stabbed him in the back. He was talking about sending the Chinese back to China and Indians back to India. That's political that he wants to participate in racial politics in Malaysia. Now he's stirring up racial feelings. Now here's his statement. And later on, now there are people coming afterwards. Malaysia became fully Muslim. Then you had the Chinese coming, you had the Indian coming, the Britishers coming. They are our new guests. You know, somebody called me a guest. So I said, before me, the Chinese are the guest. They aren't born here. So if you want the new guest to go first, ask the old guest to go back. Seems logical enough in a three hour lecture where he's talking about the double standards and hypocrisy of the media. And he gave case studies ranging from Bhagat Singh, Nelson Mandela, all the way to George Washington. And then he mentioned that the Hindus in Malaysia were still supporting the Prime Minister of India. And the main point he's trying to make here is, in India, you're not allowed to support anyone other than Modi. But here, people living in Malaysia they're not supporting the Prime Minister as much as they're supporting Modi. Now these are logical points being made by a critical thinker, yeah? But the real reason here is Malaysia is a small country, yeah? And they're getting a lot of pressure from India, as are other nations as well. And they can't afford to fight against India. Let's look at the giant Muslim nations, yeah? You got Saudi. At this moment in time, They've just invested billions in India. On the other hand, you've got Abu Dhabi. Yeah, they are giving a medal 
to the Prime Minister of India. So what do we really expect from countries like Malaysia? Because when stuff hits the fan, Malaysia is going to have no one to turn to because one country is going to be busy handing out medals and the other one's going to be busy investing in the countries of tyrants. Now whether we look at the Turkish media, the Qatari media or even the Indian media, look how they introduced Dr. Zakir Naik. Zakir Naik is somebody whose ideology has influenced many terrorists. Controversial preacher. This controversial Islamic preacher. Controversial preacher. Controversial preacher. Controversial preacher. Hate preacher Zakir Naik. Hate preacher Zakir Naik. And ironically, he's been cleared from all of these charges. I mean, let's take terrorism and extremism. The same only single newspaper reported against me. First July, the attack took place. Third July 2016, the Daily Star gave an article on me. 4th of July, majority of right. the Indian newspaper went against me. Okay. Few days later, they gave a correction. Okay, they can gave I... a correction that we never say that Again. Zakir Naik inspired the terrorist. If you read, if you read the charge sheet of the Bangladesh attack, my name is not mentioned. Right. If I was the main inspirer mm. in the Bangladeshi charge sheet when the person was accused of doing terrorism, my name should have been there. It's not there. Right. It is only there in the media. Or oh, money laundering. The judge of that court, Justice Manmohan, he said that there is no evidence at all that Dr. Zakir Naik is promoting terrorism. I've seen many of his lectures. So it's tough times. We pray that Allah has mercy and assists all the preachers that are trying to raise his name and his religion. In this day and age, if you don't have enemies, you're not doing the right thing frankly and this is the reason guys I speak out on these things and I 100% encourage you guys to do so because if you don't there's going to be a time that there's going to be no preachers left there's going to be no Muslim countries that have a spine left I mean I'm struggling already to <laughs> to find some so speak out against these injustices in whatever social media platforms you guys can. So you guys mashallah are really well spoken, more well spoken than me frankly, you know what I mean? It's a very profound quote that I live by yeah and I wanted to share it with you guys. It says it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. We know Allah has promised victory to Islam but now the question is when the going gets tough, will the tough get going? Are we going to be people that only hang around when there's glory but when things get rough we start changing our identity, we start blending in? No guys, this is an opportunity where we can get maximum reward. Now the dawah is needed, yeah? So give and you will notice that Allah when He uses you, Allah will bless you in your life. Things will start going right for you. Outwardly it may seem like you got enemies but inwardly guys you'll have peace. Why? because you are trying to raise Allah's name. If you raise Allah's name, how on earth will Allah not raise you? Until next time. Is, is it true football is coming home? Brother Muhammad Salah asked a very good question. Um, my name is Raju. After losing for Egypt and coming home empty-handed, he has the audacity to ask, what? is that football coming home? If you analyze, Assalamu alaikum.